Morning and welcome to the first meeting in 2017 of the Scottish Commission of Public Audit. Before we begin today, I'd like to welcome uh, Jackie Bailey and Bill, Bo Bill Bowman, who've joined the Commission since our last meeting. Welcome. And uh, can also put in record our thanks to John Lamont for his work as a, as a member of the Commission. I'll invite, first of all, Bill Bowman and then Jackie Bailey to uh, declare any relevant interests that they might have. Thank you. I would refer to my register of interests and to make the point that I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. I was until 2012 a partner in KPMG and in 2016 through a consultancy did some work for KPMG but I have not been involved with them since I became a member. Thank you. Jackie? Um, no specific interest to declare and I would refer members to my register of interests. Thank you very much and again welcome to the Commission. Um, maybe at this point I should just remind members and, uh, and uh, the public to switch off the mobile phones. Agenda one. Agenda item one. That's the election of a, a deputy chair because uh, John Lamont, of course, uh, has now left us. And uh, I would seek nominations for the position of deputy chair. And uh, I'd like to nominate Bill Bowman. Are there any other nominations? Do you accept the nomination, Bill? Oh, yes, thank you. In that case, uh, welcome as, uh, as Deputy Chair. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item two, which is uh, the decision on taking business on private. Uh, are members agreed to take item four on private today? Thank you. In that case, agenda item three is the Audit Scotland annual report and accounts for the year to 31st March 2016 and the auditor's report on the accounts. And maybe at this point I could maybe just uh, um, put on record um, our thanks to Douglas Sinclair, who's passed away for his services and uh, obviously our, uh, our sympathy to the family. Um, I think it was in was it March that this happened? Yes, he passed away in March. He was previously a director, of course. So, agenda item three relates to taking evidence and audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for 2016-17. Now, members have a copy of the annual report and their meeting papers, along with the auditor's report, by, by the auditor's report by Alexander Sloan on those accounts. There will be taken evidence both from Audit Scotland and from Alexander Sloan at today's meeting. But I'd like to welcome uh, Ian Leach, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland, and Ian's accompanied by Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, Dan McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Russell Frith, Assistant Auditor General. So I'd like to first uh, invite uh, Ian Leach as Chair of the Board to, to make a short introductory statement of no more than two minutes. Time is tight. Uh, and followed by the Auditor General. Ian. Very tough constraint, that, Chair, but I thank you very much. As you know, the main task of the Board, in addition to the statutory duty to provide the property staff and services required by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission, is to oversee Audit Scotland's operations and make sure it achieves its objectives and its aims and to ensure we get value for money because it looks at everybody else to get value for money. In the last year, we have streamlined our work to ensure we keep pace with wider changes in Scotland's public finances. Significant steps have been taken to improve the efficiency and relevance of our audits and ensure quality is maintained. <clears throat> During the past year, we have delivered a new Code of Audit Practice 2016 and a smooth transition of new audit appointments and auditors for the next five years. This will save around £1 million per annum. The Board was sad to hear, as you have indicated, Chair, of the death of our colleague Douglas Sinclair, who spent many years as Chair of the Accounts Commission and therefore by statute a member of the Audit Scotland Board. We have recorded our appreciation for his services and our regrets at his passing. His successor, Ronnie Hines, has recently been appointed to the Board in his temporary role as Acting Chair. Finally, I'd like to thank my fellow Board members and the Accountable Officer and all our staff for the hard work. And with your permission, Chair, and hopefully within the time limit set, Caroline can now add a few words. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. As you'll see from the annual report, we've maintained our focus on our core work. We carried out over 300 annual audits and produced 20 performance audits in areas such as the NHS, social work and policing. On behalf of the Accounts Commission, we've developed a new approach to the best value audit of local government, and we've also been developing our approach to Scotland's significant new financial powers. All of this has been underpinned by internal work to continue to improve the quality, value and relevance of what we do. We've developed a new, simpler and more transparent system for determining audit fees to ensure that audited bodies, Parliament and our other stakeholders have assurance on the cost and the quality of the services we provide. We've continued to reduce audit fees by 6.7% overall for 2016-17 audits. Looking ahead, we also secured approval for our budget for 2017-18, which will result in a reduction of 6.5% in gross expenditure compared to the 2016-17 budget. This year's annual report records a substantial increase in the number of visitors to our website, as well as the number of downloads of our reports, and our social media engagement is also up. I hope this demonstrates that our work continues to be relevant and is reaching a growing audience. We continue to focus on communicating our messages as clearly as possible. As always, Chair, we're happy to answer the Commission's questions as best we can. Thank you, Caroline. Perhaps I can start with the first question. On page six of the annual report, Audit Scotland states that 89.5% of central government audit reports were completed by their due dates, compared to 96% in 2015-16. Similarly, 95.7% of NHS audit reports were completed by their due dates, compared to 100% in the previous year. Obviously, there seems to be a little bit of a deterioration there. Can Audit Scotland indicate what the reasons might be for that? Convener. It's worth noting that they were all delivered within the statutory deadline um, of 31st December, but I'll ask Russell to take you through the, the um, handful there that you've identified from the report. Sorry. Hand it back if you need to. Sorry. Um, yeah, a small number were uh, later than our target dates, um, which, as Caroline has already said, uh, are well within the statutory dates. Um, in most cases, these were only by a few they only missed the target dates by a few days, generally due to the timing of the availability of uh, accountable officers or audit committee uh, meeting dates. So they were not anything that gave us any great uh, concern in terms of the, the delivery of audits. As I think you're already aware, one central government body was uh, much closer to the statutory deadline, and that was the police authority, which um, was also subject to a Section 22 report. Were there any other reports that were significantly delayed? The No, that was the one that was... Just the one? Just the one, yeah. OK, thank you. Jackie? Um, page 15 of your report identifies um, the need to improve the working environment of your Glasgow office as a priority for the forthcoming financial year. Um, I wondered whether you could uh, enlighten the committee as to why the Glasgow office has been identified, uh, simply because recently it was part of an overall rationalisation programme. So I'd be keen to understand what, what is actually going on there. You're absolutely right. We've been coming to the end of an overall property strategy, which has refreshed and streamlined our prop property portfolio. I'll ask Diane to talk you through our plans for Glasgow. Uh, thank you. We're um, extending and increasing the number of flexible touchdown working spaces in the Glasgow office, and that reflects the different geographical we need following the round of new audit appointments, where we have slightly more people who are Glasgow-based working in the west of Scotland and not located in um, the audit offices of our clients. So we just need to increase um, and, and make available more touchdown space for people moving in and out. So um, we've, we're um, doing the work over the summer and it will be um, open to staff at the beginning of August. So it just increases, um, makes, makes the workplace more flexible and increases our um, capacity to support colleagues in Glasgow. The, the cost of doing that, and is that accommodated within your budget? It's within uh, next year's budget. It's not within uh, the annual report and accounts budget, but we, it's met within the resources that we have. Thank you very much. 
Great. Oh, and I'm on question three as well. There you go. Um, seven auditor opinions were modified this year, one in further education, two in central government, one in the NHS, and I'm told three in local government. Um, were there any additional resource implications for Audit Scotland arising from those modified audit reports? Russell, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> yes, <laughs> if I can. Yeah, um, sorry. Um, yes, in the case of the um, Scottish Police Authority, which was one of those that was modified as well, it was modified on the grounds that the authority had not kept proper records on its property, plant and equipment throughout the year, though it was able to satisfy the auditor at the end of the year that the figures were materially correct. The there was additional time taken to... Uh, work through all of that and get to the point where the auditor was satisfied um, and that re did result in an additional fee being charged to the uh, police authority. Similarly, um, NHS Shetland was also had a modified report for the same reason uh, and again the audit fee was increased uh, so, as a so result. There are no issues for you then about having additional resource because you recharge that? Where they are chargeable audits, which those okay. were. Um, had those been non-chargeable audits, then potentially, yes, it would have been a, a resource issue. And is that accommodated? We have an allowance within our overall um, work plan for uh, a bit of additional audit work. Um, and the, uh, But in this case, there were all ones where we could make additional charges. OK, thank you, convener. Can I ask how much the additional cost was to both these bodies? I think I'd better say we will let you have that fr information after. From memory, I believe the Scottish Police Authority was £40,000. I can't remember what the Shetland one was. OK, significant you could let less. us know. Yeah. Um, Alison. Um, thank you, convener. Um, on page 18, we learn that Audit Scotland has received a total of seven complaints um, from members of the public during 2016-17. That's an increase from 15 in 2015-16. Um, could you provide some background to the nature of these complaints? Were they vaguely similar? Um, what was the outcome and what lessons have been learned? Thank you. Um, I'll have a first run through and Diane may wish to add to what I say. Um, of the seven complaints that we identify in the report, one was out with our complaints handling process it, as it wasn't about us um, and we advised the complainant to contact the um, ombudsman. We always try to be as helpful as we can so we advise them to take that one on. Um, one was about the lack of response to an inquiry that had been made to us and it was upheld as we investigated it. Two were in relation to Glasgow Gl Clyde College. Uh, two were in relation to our role as the Auditor of Aberdeen City and, and particularly in relation to Marischal Square. And one was in our um, relation to our role as Aberdeen City and the insurance policies that it holds. Um, in those cases, uh, either the complaint was not upheld or partially upheld. And we've recognised in a few cases that we could have communicated with complainants earlier in the process, um, improved our process for doing so and apologised to the individual involved. It's a useful source of learning for us to see how we can handle what's often a very varied range of complaints, sometimes about us and sometimes about audited bodies, and we always seek to learn from them. And is it the case that those who did complain are satisfied with the response they received? Um, I think it's hard for us to answer that. We, we always ask um, people who complain about us and people who contact us about audited bodies for their feedback on how well we've handled it. Um, I think it, uh, the, the response will vary depending on whether uh, the complaint was upheld or not, uh, but we take it very seriously and we report the handling of complaints regularly to the board so that they have oversight of the process. Okay. Ian may wish to add to that. Uh, yes. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of complaints. But we did find a deficiency in our system here, which has now been corrected, as Caroline has mentioned. Because of the position that Scotland enjoys, perhaps that's the wrong word, it has anyway, as a matter of fact, in looking at other bodies, we're extremely conscious of the need to ensure that we are above reproach. No one's perfect and there will always be errors, and there was a system error here. The number of complaints was small, and those that are partial upheld, we try to get people to respond. But you know yourself, 
if people are satisfied, they'll generally not say they're satisfied. If there continued dissatisfaction, you may get a response and find it. So we do our best to try and monitor this because we value absolutely the reputation that Scotland has and we wish to maintain it. Okay. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to ask you about staffing. On page 22, um, you report that staffing costs exceeded the budget by 0 0.8 million. 0 0.2 million of that um, relates to temporary staff. I wonder if you could sort of explain the apparent uh, contradiction um, whereby the number of temporary staff exceeded your budget to that amount, yet full-time staff are being released um, by way of early retirement and severance in the early part of 2017-18. Certainly. Um, we've had a policy over the last five years of um, looking to reshape our workforce to make sure that um, we're getting the right skill mix in place to carry out the work we need and that we can respond to new responsibilities like the integration authorities and particularly the work around uh, the Scottish Parliament's new financial powers. So we have had um, some voluntary severances over that period, which um, you'll see in the annual report. Um, at the... Um, at the same time, uh, we've had growth in some areas, uh, new financial powers and integration authorities being the obvious example, where we've had some, some movements going on there. And we have a deliberate policy of using um, temporary staff in a planned way for two particular purposes. One is that the annual audit cycle has a very significant peak over the summer each year as we head towards the sign-off of audited bodies um, in a, a very compressed period, particularly for NHS bodies, which are due to be uh, completed by the end of next week. Um, and the secondly, second need is to bring in particular skills um, for the performance audit work we do, where we're looking to bring in people with expertise in the areas that we're looking at for a, a, a significant but limited period of time. Um, and we often fulfil that with secondments from other public bodies um, to make sure we've got the skills we need to do our work well. So you will see that sort of shifting going on against a backdrop of reshaping our workforce. We plan to use temporary staff for those reasons. Diane, do you want to add to that? Uh, the only other reason that we use um, agency staff is maternity and paternity cover, um, and we've had a bountiful year this year in um, audit, audit productivity. What's this the normal duration of your temporary staff then? What's it? I know that it'll vary, but just generally? It, it does vary. If we're talking about the um, peak audit period each year, that would typically be two or three months, people mm -hmm. in for that period and away. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about somebody working on a particular um, uh, performance audit or area of policy, it could be a period of up to two years. Okay. Um, so, for example, we have somebody on secondment with us now from Scotland's Rural College helping us to think about rural issues across our okay. programme of work for a a couple of years that would be the extreme end. and so this is a sort of continuous work model or pattern that will go on yeah absolutely it's part of our workforce plan okay. and we would expect to continue sure. working that way thank you if i can just go on to um again with with jobs um can you offer any background to the specific reasons that um new job roles grading and pay and reward arrangements will be a key priority in 2017 because you you, you say that on page 15 of the report um, at the end of 16-17, um, we agreed a new um, package of pay terms and conditions and uh, rules with our trade union representatives, and that was put to a ballot of staff and um, who voted um, overwhelmingly in favour of it. So we're implementing a new way of um, managing careers and managing recruitment and internal promotions and so on. So what we're looking forward to in 1718 is really embedding those new principles of work. We did a lot of work. We worked for two years with um, union colleagues and staff to design a new system, to take into account how people wanted to work, um, the aspirations people have for careers. Our new system is designed around all of that. Um, getting the agreement is one thing, making it come to life uh, this year is another, and that's what we'll be focused on. Okay. Comment. Um, I, I think Diane has it's talked about the, the next phase of this. Um, mm -hmm. As Auditor General, I see it as a key way of us being able to keep responding for the, to the changes in um, Scotland's public services and public finances to help mm -hmm. people um, develop satisfying careers in a context where um, public pay is constrained. We're, we're looking to make jobs as flexible as possible and to give people as many opportunities to broaden their skills and experience mm -hmm. as possible while delivering what Parliament expects of us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, General, you, you, you 
I mean, touch, you touched on the additional financial powers and so on that are coming down to, to Scotland. And obviously there's going to be very substantial changes over the next year or two. Are you satisfied that you, at this moment, have enough resources to be able to deal with that and to prepare with that, prepare for that? Um, I know we've asked you this before, but it's something that uh, the Commission has a considerable interest in. At this moment, yes, I can give you that assurance, Chair. Um, the Commission has been good enough over the last couple of years to support our investment in developing our thinking, our understanding of these issues, and developing our response. Um, and members of the Public Audit Committee will have seen the reports that we've published in this area already. Um, we are at the stage now, I think, of having a much clearer understanding of what this means in terms of additional audit responsibilities with the establishment now of Revenue Scotland, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, and with legislation passing through Parliament today, the Social Security Agency, um, and it's probably a good opportunity for me to ask you to look out for a substantive resource bid in our budget bid in the autumn, looking ahead to the longer term, um, to reflect what we now know will be required in those areas based on the work we've been doing over the last couple of years. So you will be coming for additional resources? Um, we. We think that we know that with the new bodies that are being established, there will be a need for um, audit resource to do that. And we think that given the um, requirements on Parliament to be scrutinising a much more complex budget, which includes, um, for the first time, significant revenue raising powers, raising about 50% of what's spent in Scotland, and managing social security powers that will have a significant impact on the lives of a lot of the most vulnerable in Scotland, we will need to come back to you with proposals for how we resource that work and support Parliament in its scrutiny of those new responsibilities. Um, and we're working up those proposals just now for our budget bid later in the year. Now, if you're taking on additional responsibilities and work, that means somebody's giving up responsibilities and work. Would, maybe it's an unfair question, but uh, would one offset the other? It's a very timely question. Um, we are currently um, thinking through with colleagues in government and um, in the National Audit Office at a UK level uh, how some of these newly devolved areas that will continue to be the focus of both the, the UK Parliament and in future the Scottish Parliament should be audited and held accountable. Um, I suspect it won't be as simple as saying there's an offset in there because both parliaments will retain an interest, um, but I think it will depend to an extent on the, the detailed shape of the new audit and accountability arrangements that are put in place and they are still developing. I think a concern would be if there was a significant overlap yes. and a duplication of effort. I, I would share that concern, both in terms of resourcing and in terms of clear accountability for the services and the finances that are being managed. Um, so we're, we're at the early stages of looking at the proposals for the very new areas, but I think it's an entirely appropriate question to ask. Okay. Bill? Um, thank you, convener. Um, maybe I could just say at the beginning this is a, a sort of a new venture to me and there's quite a lot of paper to read and your report is... Um, quite recent, so I, I've read it and drilled down through some of the links as well to the sort of sub sub report. So if I haven't quite got my understanding correct and your structure and your organisation, which is perhaps a little bit unique, um, please take that in, in that context. Um, to me, audit quality is kind of key to an organisation like this, and you know I find reference to quality and approach to quality but it perhaps wasn't the sort of up front and center that I was expecting and I thought the key risk would be a risk of audit failure um, and it, it I suppose is in there and that well, that's just a comment on the way I I read the read the report one thing I would ask for and you don't necessarily need to tell me now but um, to understand the structure of regulation that you operate under is it from outside or is it internally generated and I know you have a quality control um, section. I, I'd be interested to know the actual results of the reviews that you that you did at, at some point. And if, <laughs> before I get into my real question, uh, one question specifically on the financials. Uh, I see you've got a large pension deficit, and I, there's quite a bit of explanation of how it's calculated. But I wasn't quite clear as to what it actually means to the organisation and if it actually has any impact on what you do or whether it's a uh, Somebody else's problem that um, that appears in there. Thank so, you. Yeah. Oh, 
I'll, I'll kick off. I'll give Russell notice. I'll ask him to come in, um, particularly on the pension question, um, but I'm sure he'll also have something to say on quality. The first thing to say is that I absolutely share your concern about audit quality. Our reputation stands or falls by the quality of the work we do. Um, we know that um, in the current political climate in Scotland, it's very thoroughly tested by stakeholders um, from a whole range of perspectives, and it has to fulfil all of our professional requirements and stand up to that sort of challenge, and, and I take that very seriously. I hope you'll be reassured to know that alongside the annual report, we also publish a separate audit quality report, which was published on the same day, and we can send you a copy of it. Um, it's also worth noting that we're currently reviewing our quality arrangements for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, I think the expectations of our work keep on increasing um, with the, the change in Scotland's financial powers and the debate that's underway about public services and how best they should be delivered. Um, we have just moved into a new round of audit appointments, uh, which have generated some efficiency savings for us, and that obviously um, raises the risk that audit quality may not be at the level we want it to be. Um, and I'm very conscious that the audit quality arrangements we have in place are robust and effective and meet all of the professional standards required, but they don't give us the same information about all of the audit providers, firstly between our significant in-house audit practice and the firms that we appoint to do about a third of the work, and secondly between the financial audit work and the performance audit work. So we're currently reviewing that. We've agreed in principle that we um, will go ahead and commission um, external assurance about all of the audit work. We currently do that um, for the in-house financial audit and rely on the FRC's regulation and ICAS's regulation of the firms that we work with. But we want to bring that to a level playing field. Um, and we are strengthening the role of the audit committee of the board in overseeing that quality assurance and making sure that it provides the assurance that they expect on behalf of me the Auditor General. Russell, do you want to add to that? <coughs> yeah, if I may. Yes, just to be clear on the regulation, Audit Scotland, in the same way as the NAO or the Wales Audit Office, are not um, formally subject to regulation for the bulk of their work by the FRC or one of the institutes, as a, pr a private sector firm would be. But all of the Auditors General have voluntarily agreed that they will adopt the ISAs uh, and the ethical standards in the conduct of their work. And we work on the basis as if we were a regulated firm. Uh, as the Auditor General said, our financial audit work, apart from being subject to internal uh, reviews, is subject every second year to a review by ICAS, who come in and review a sample of files that they pick um, we don't tell them which ones. And we are currently looking to extend that, the scope of that work to include the firms and the other types of audit work. The firms, which obviously are regulated by the FRC or ICAS, ICAW, um, those regulatory reviews tend not to include the audits that, uh, where we've made the, made the appointments. That's why we're looking to plug that, that, that gap and extend the, the, the scope of it. In relation to pensions, um, then you, you're quite right. The, uh, the deficit that is identified in our accounts uh, relates to the bulk of our staff who are in the local government pension scheme, the, the Lothian uh, element of that. And what it represents is our share of the overall deficit in the scheme as calculated by the actuary um, in accordance with the accounting standards, IAS 19 in this case. What it means for us is that when the, the actuary comes along to calculate the um, contribution rate going forward, they will calculate the rate for the existing staff going forward, the cost of, of providing those pensions, and also they add on to that an element to um, contribute to catching up that deficit over a period of years. Um, currently, they use, uh, I think, about 20 years for um, bodies such as Audit Scotland. Thank you for that. Just on the quality point, then, be interested um, to see how your work develops on, on that. And for the pension, so you're, there is no immediate impact on your cash requirements to meet that. 
there are two elements to that, and I apologise in advance for the complexity of this. It's something we, we struggle with every year. Um, for the, there's one element where um, we routinely, in our spring budget revision bit, by agreement with the government, come forward to meet um, the known shortfall during the financial year. The accounting adjustment we need to make after the year, we have routinely um, consumed ourselves within our resources. You'll see from the report that this year, for the first time, that included quite a significant um, reduction in the um, underspend that we had managed for for the year. Um, and obviously, as a counterblast, officer, I'm keeping a very close eye on that and how we think it will move in future. So, so far, it's been managed in, in routine business for us, but given the very low discount rates we're now working with and the increases in life expectancy that are still working through the actuarial report, it's something we're keeping under close review. May I ask my question? Of course. <laughs> um, in the financial statements, um, I think on page 29, you say that most internal audits in 2016-17 have achieved substantial assurance, being the highest standard available from your internal auditors. Which um, reports did not conclude with substantial assurance, and what, if anything, either in terms of lessons have been learned or consequences followed? Diane, can you pick that one up for us? Um, the, all reports received substantial assurance, both on the design and the operational effectiveness of the controls we have in place. Um, IT, information and IT and information security received reasonable, uh, which is the next level down, on both design and operational effectiveness. Um, there were a number six of uh, low-level um, improvements that we could make. And that was very helpful. This year, we have um, spent a lot of time assessing and scrutinising our IT information security, as you can imagine. We were accredited for um, our ISO accreditation, which you'll see in the report, which is the, the global standard on IT security. The internal audit um, looked at that work, but also more widely at some other um, documentation and records. And we're very pleased to continually have um, intern, external uh, review, in this case through internal audit, which is helping us um, continually tr strive further to improve. We're having our next ISO audit um, over the summer, and we've been working again to maintain and enhance the accreditation that we have there. So no serious concerns? So no serious issues, all um, recording operational or documentation issues. Okay. Alison? Thank you, convener. On page 32, Audit Scotland makes reference to the information security arrangements that, that you have in place, um, given that you hold sensitive and personal data, and you advise that an extensive information security framework is in place. So given the number of recent high-profile cyber attacks, can Audit Scotland provide further details of the information security framework and the extent to which this is reviewed and tested? Certainly, Diane. Um, certainly, as I said, um, over the course of the year, um, both through internal audit and external accreditation, we focused a lot on this. Um, we were not affected by the WannaCry uh, virus, which affected large parts of the public and private sector. And partly that is because of the ways in which we uh, manage the um, patching update systems that we have, a feature of which was reviewed in the internal audit. Um, we have... Um, we commission external testing of our um, security to provide us with ongoing um, information. We this year also ran internal um, checks, sending um, fake emails internally to see if people would click on links, and then we report back to, to colleagues to say, in this case, it was really good. No one clicked on the, the links which might have contained viruses. And we have a rigorous programme um, of all of that. Since the WannaCry virus, we have um, been running weekly updates on Yammer, our internal social networking site, to let people know um, what else we can do. We've run some training sessions for colleagues, and we've been sharing um, both for our own, the management of our own security, but also for the information security auditing work that we do as part of our programme of audits. We've been sharing current thinking and best practice on IT auditing and security. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive um, and it is the subject of um, regular reports to our audit committee. It has been a feature of our internal audit programme um, each year for the past several years and I can't see that changing. 
I mean, yesterday in Health Committee, one of one of the committees I sit on, we were looking at the the issue of the recent cyber attacks, and we had two uh, senior IT um, officers who work for the NHS, and we also had Professor Bill Buchanan from Napier University, who's regarded as something of an expert in this field, and he was pointing out that medical records are now regarded as, uh, you know, th they're worth more than than a credit card, for example. So. This clearly is an, uh, an area of great concern, and I know I think the NHS were also, uh, you know, reaching out to staff, sending test emails to see how people were reacting. And I, it, it seems that you know perhaps you weren't hit because your your own practice is fairly sound. How I'd like to understand how Audit Scotland are liaising with or other organisations because. You know, being caught out in this way or being affected by cybercrime could have a serious impact on many organisations' accounts. So what joint working is going on in that regard? It's a very good question. Um, first of all, um, we recognise that as auditors we have privileged access to sensitive information from all of the public bodies right across Scotland, so we have a duty to treat that with as much care and attention as they do. And that, um, is reflected in, in the approach that Diane's outlined for you. Secondly, in our audit work, auditors um, will routinely see uh, digital risks as being one of the risks that they have to be addressing through their work as part of the wider scope of public audit, which is enshrined in the new code of audit practice that's mentioned in our annual, um, audit, our annual report here. Um, that wider scope, over and above the financial statements, uh, asks the auditors not just to review um, governance arrangements, including information security, but for the first time to draw a conclusion about them. And that involves them working closely with the audited bodies to understand the risks they, they face in a particular um, set of circumstances, how they're addressing them, and how they're dealing with any shortfalls or problems that they face. And we also do our best to act as a, to use our um, ability to look right across public bodies and um, to work with our audit colleagues across the UK to spread good practice. Um, so we're, we're able to act in that way to remind people of what, what good practice looks like, to respond quite quickly when a new threat emerges. Um, and I think we see that most clearly in the NHS and in local authorities, where there's a large number of similar bodies and we can act as that um, focus for passing out either warnings or good practice when that's necessary. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, on page 33, you do make reference to, to a breach in your records management policy. Um, and you reported during the year it was established that there hadn't been full compliance with that record management policy and that some documents weren't being retained for, for the period that you would expect them to be. Um, and you state that almost all of the documents were recovered, but clearly not all of the documents uh, have been recovered. So. Can you just tell us a bit more about how this situation arose and what will happen? You know, you know how, how will you address the fact that some of these documents simply weren't recovered? I'll ask Diane to come in in a moment. Um, it's probably worth starting by saying the problem arose because of the focus we have on information security. Um, our document management system is set up on the basis that documents will expire after a certain period unless they're marked as records and retained. Um, and that was the, the um, issue that led to the problem. Diane can talk you through what happened and what we've done in response. Um, so we were able to um, recover using our resilience and recovery mechanisms um, a, a version of the files to a certain date. Um, we have um, recovered, um, as we see in the report, um, almost all of the documents. There are a few supporting reports for um, some of the work that we do. Um, that are uh, that we haven't been able to recover, but we they are not significant uh, for the work. The, the work is all concluded, and these were supporting pieces of information. The primary reason for um, for the issue is, is really um, just colleagues on occasion hadn't followed the guidance that we have in place, and in, on occasion this has just been um, compounded by um, absence or. Um, busy periods of work. So we've done um, a lot on the back of this exercise to share all the information we know about um, with colleagues about what was happening. We've enhanced our processes. We have done uh, refresher training for everyone on how the records management system works and, um, and so on. And I think 
um, we are all very uh, concerned to ensure we learn the lessons. We've implemented them as well as we can. We know this comes down to how we as people use the systems that we have, and that's been a very big um, alert for us, and we've used that to um, develop training and uh, discussion sessions with colleagues to make sure everyone's aware of what happens if we don't follow the procedures. Thankfully, in this case, the actual loss is, is quite small, um, but the learning is quite big. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Could I ask a follow-up to that? Of course, if I may. So, were these documents to do with the running of the business or the running of the um, the engagements? Were there audit documents? Do you have electronic audit files? These are electronic documents. They're all electronic documents and um, th and they related to both the running of the business and a few audit assignments. Okay. Bill, over at you. Oh, I thought I'd done mine. <laughs> I think um, your budget proposal for 2015-16 and its actual outcome is shown on page 57 of the annual report. And you had significantly underspent on all except two budget lines, rent and rates and IT. Um, can you confirm that these underspends identified are recurring, non-recurring? What will they, how will they come through into the next year? I think if I'm right, and Russell will keep me straight, that page 57 shows the actual rather than the budget um, for the two years, 15-16 and 16-17. Um, we can certainly explain the variance between the two years, but just for clarity, I think it's actuals. Um, and Russell can pick up the IT and rent and rates lines um, from that page. 57. Yeah. Yeah, the, the IT costs on page 57 uh, actually came down from uh, 15, 16 to 16, 17 actuals. Um, and that's largely because of the um, 16, 17 is the first full year of being in the new single Edinburgh office. So we were able to, so that's reflecting the uh, efficiencies of being in one place rather than another. In relation to the 1617 budget, the IT line is higher. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One is further investment in um, IT resilience um, to make sure we're not subject to uh, vulnerability to things like uh, WannaCry, and also to increases in software licensing costs um, particularly from Microsoft, but from other suppliers as well. As well. Um, just uh, one last thing there. On page 35, the annual report states that a benefit in kind provided for the Director of Audit Services has increased by 16% from 4,500 to 5,002, following an increase in the previous year of 18%. What, what's the reasons of the increase over, th over that period, and what governance do you have over approving such increases? The benefit in kind for the Director of Audit Services is the provision of a car under our car scheme. Um, she is the only director who receives a car and it reflects the nature of her role, which is managing our um, in-house audit practice across Scotland. Um, it's a very mobile role compared to the other management team members here. The figure for the benefit in kind um, that we are required to show in the accounts is the taxable benefit as assessed by HMRC, um, and it reflects both the taxable value of the car and HMRC's um, decisions about the way in which that is taxed for a given individual. Um, the increase simply reflects the difference in the um, way in which the um, benefit is assessed by HMRC and not any difference in the cost to audit Scotland, which is uh, capped and fixed for all employees. Okay, thank you. I'd like to just pick up one or two things in the report in the time-honoured way. Um, on page 9, uh, bullet point 5, of well, 4 and 5 really, um, again, you've referred earlier on in this meeting to reductions in fee levels. I think almost every year you've cut fees, 
you're now in a position, of course, where that probably, and I'll welcome your comment on that, won't be possible in the next, certainly in the next year or two, because you're going to be asking for more money. Would it have been better not to have cut the fees this year and uh, retain the funds within, within the business? There are two slightly different things going on there, Chair. Um, the, um, you're absolutely right that, as I said earlier, we will be making a bid to the SCPA for additional resources for new financial powers. What we're referring to in the bullet point here is the level of fees for the bodies um, for whom we charge fees under the statute that covers us. Um, and that reflects both our internal programme of efficiencies that we've touched on and the first part of the new procurement of audits for the next five years which generated some savings for us that will work out across five years. You're also right that we have consistently reduced fees over the last few years and of course there comes a point where you can't do that anymore. Um, we are in the middle now of putting in place our financial strategy for the next three years which will help us make decisions about how best to um, manage our finances overall and convert them into fee levels for the three quarters of our income that comes from fees. Um, you'll recall that we are constrained in that both by the legislation which requires us to break even taking one year with another and doesn't enable us to carry reserves forward um, and by the fees policy which we've consulted the SCPA on which aims to bring in more balance across individual sectors from year to year. Um, so the, the um, savings that we've made so far we think are a useful contribution to the financial pressures on public bodies. They can't continue indefinitely um, but there, there is a difference between the fees we charge and the new responsibilities for um, things like the Social Security Agency and the Scottish Government increases that will come through in future. You've touched on uh, fees and the work you've been doing on fees, which of course this Commission has been very much interested in for over a period of several years. Have you now completed that exercise and uh, are, are we satisfied that there's no possibility of cross-subsidy or you know, similar anomalies? We have completed the work um, and as part of that, as you know, we have reached, um, the board has agreed that we will aim to balance each sector taking one year with another rather than the overall fees, which is what our statutory provisions require. Um, we're currently um, finalising the management information that's needed to help us monitor that throughout the financial year and obviously at the budget setting period we'll be in a good position to um, check in on where we are and how we take that forward. Um, we saw some fairly significant movements between sectors last year at the start of the new audit appointments. We saw significant reductions, for example, for local authorities and NHS bodies and a, a shift um, in different directions in the central government and FE sectors reflecting some historical historic imbalances that were there. We think those are now thoroughly worked through, but we're still monitoring that carefully, given it is a significant change in our financial management and the overall approach, approach that we take to raising fees. <coughs> Your keen interest in this, we did supply you with the fee strategy last year, and we did indicate that I had been looking at this question of cross-subsidy. It's unhealthy to have one sector cross subsidising. It was historical, and we've, after a public consultation with our client groups, we introduced a strategy, and I think it was endorsed by your committee, which is transparent and it shows where the proper charges should be. And that's what we are doing. Good. On page 14, the very first point there, we are developing a new communications and engagement strategy and engaged extensively with the Scottish Parliament Committees and Scottish Parliament Information Centre. Can you give me a little bit more information about that? Certainly. Um, I'm very conscious as Auditor General that I'm, I'm here to support Parliament in its scrutiny of public spending across Scotland. Um, in the past, um, our focus has rightly been very much on the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee and we will continue to provide that service. Um, but we have been conscious with the new financial powers and with the um, debate about the role of subject committees that there's more we can do to support subject committees as well. So with the election of the new parliament last May, um, we started a process in consultation with our colleagues in the clerking team um, in SPICE and the thinking around uh, continuing professional development for members about how we can support that. Um, as we say in the report, we've engaged um, quite significantly with a number of committees, the Health and Social Care Committee, 
education um, and uh, the finance committees in particular um, around the work that we do that is relevant to them. Um, and we hope we can continue that as the Parliament reviews its process for overseeing the budget um, at the end of the budget process review at the end of this term. I'm just turning to page 46 uh, on the balance sheet. Uh, intangible assets, a note to intangible assets, it doesn't actually tell you what the intangible assets are. I was quite interested in knowing because I see they've increased substantially over the previous year. Uh, they're software licences, um, Chair, and as Russell said earlier, the, um, the cost of software uh, licences and therefore their value has increased over the last year and that reflects the change that you're seeing in the balance sheet. Now, I'm looking at uh, page 52 pension assets and liabilities and there seems to be I presume these are assumptions here of salary increases of 4.4% which seems a little bit optimistic that, and that's pension not, increases of 24 yeah, That's not the case but I'll ask Russell to explain to you why it's not the case. These are the, the long term uh, average assumptions made by the actuary about the total increase in the, um, the salary costs, total salary costs of the employers. So it takes into account not only um, the cost of living increases, it takes account of increments as well. And it also takes account of the fact that over people's working lifetimes, you, ex you may expect to see them promoted during the course of their uh, working life. So it's it's a an overall average increase in um if you like the the salary employment cost of people that's required when you're using a final salary based pension scheme. Thank you. Do any of the members have any other questions that they would like to ask? No? In that case I'll Thank the, the, the witnesses for your attendance and uh, suspend for a couple of minutes just to allow a change of panel. We now move to evidence from the Auditors of Audit Scotland, Alexander Sloan, and I would welcome Stephen Cunningham, partner at Alexander Sloan, and Gillian So, Audit Manager at Alexander Sloan. Welcome. Perhaps uh, we've got one or two questions. I'll maybe start with the first one. Um, we note that you've issued a true and fair audit opinion following your work at Audit Scotland and Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts. Can you confirm that you've received all the necessary information and explanations required by you to form your opinion on the financial statements? Okay. Good afternoon, Kevina. Uh, yes, I'm happy to confirm we've received all necessary information and explanations which allow us to undertake our audit for the year ended 31st March 2017. I would like, now I'd just like to give an overview of our work, if that's okay. Absolutely. The firm of Alexander Sloan has been appointed to carry out the external audit of the 2017 Financial Statements of Audit Scotland. 
We carried out an interim audit in February and the final audit work was carried out in May and early June. Our audit was carried out in accordance with international standards and auditing. And as I mentioned earlier, we received all information and explanations that were required to carry out our work and the audit was completed without any problems. We signed our audit report on the 13th of June 2017. Based on our audit work, we form an opinion on whether the Council should soon fair view, whether they've been prepared in accordance with international financial reporting standards as interpreted and adapted by the Financial Reporting Manual, and to confirm they've been properly prepared in accordance with the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000 and directions by Scottish Ministers. Our audit report is unmodified, that is, we're satisfied the counts do give a soon fair view and in accordance with legislation and the accounting rules. There are no significant matters which require to be brought to the attention of the Commission or the leaders of the accounts. We are also required to prepare a management letter based on our audit findings, and the purpose of this report is to summarise the key issues arising from our audit and they should report any weaknesses in the accounting system and internal controls that have come to attention during the audit. I'm pleased to report that in the course of our audit work this year, we didn't find any weaknesses in the accounting and internal controls. Finally, I would like to record my firm's thanks to the staff at Audit Scotland and the support staff at the SCPA for the assistance during the audit this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alison, would you like to continue? Yes, um, that all sounds very positive. Um, thank you. So I, I'm not expecting that, that you will have anything significant to, to respond with to this question, but in your report to those charged with governance as required by the International Standard on Auditing and in your report to the Audit Committee of Audit Scotland, did you raise any matters that this Commission should be aware of? No, there was no matter there. So there's no significant matters we felt uh, should be raised to the committee. Okay, thank you, convener. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, Audit Scotland included a sum of 1.7 million or thereabouts in their accounts, which relates to work to be completed, but hadn't yet been charged for. Are you satisfied that the calculation of the figure is robust? Yes, I mean we. We had a, a detailed look at the working progress figures and we're happy with the working progress figures within the balance sheet of the accounts. Okay. Can you explain, just for the benefit of the committee, um, how this process is undertaken? You know, how you reassured yourself that actually the process is, is okay? We, we spend a lot of time looking at the working progress figure uh, due to the nature of uh, the figure, it, it does involve a number of assumptions and they were, we therefore spend a lot of detailed time going through looking at the time recorded in the system, the methodology used, uh, the fees which have been agreed, the progress, any changes which have been made uh, to the assumption in terms of the time completed, uh, just to make sure that we are satisfied that that figure is reasonable in terms of the annual accounts. Okay, thank you very much, convener. Rora? Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, my question is pretty much a sort of recap of, of what you said at the start and, and what's, what's been asked. It's just um, to sort of reassure us that this committee relies on your company's expertise in its consideration of Audit Scotland's uh, annual report and accounts. And it's particularly relevant um, to the highly technical accounting requirement around pension costs and liabilities in particular. So can you confirm that you're satisfied with all such disclosures in the 2016-17 annual report and accounts? Um, yes, I can confirm. Um, again, we had a detailed look at the pension liabilities. We considered the actuary report and we considered the assumptions used by the actuary. Um, and based on the order work, these all appear reasonable and we're happy with the figures stated. Julian, do you have anything to add? No. Um, Stephen has said we check the accuracy of the, the figures. And, and the nothing accounts. flagged up, no anomalies no. or anything? No, we're happy. Thank oh, you. Well, we're happy then. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thanks, Thank you. Um, May I do you, Sorry, please go, go ahead. Uh, can I ask, if, during the course of your work, did you come up with any audit adjustments that may then have been processed by Audit Scotland or were the accounts as presented to you un, unadjusted? 
to you. Yes, I like. The accounts as presented to us were unadjusted. Um, there was various discussions took place during the course of the audit and re received um, satisfactory replies to our questions, uh, which resulted in no adjustments to the financial statements. There might there would have been one or two figures which would have been changed slightly in terms of how they'd been presented, but nothing um, materially significant mm -hmm. in terms of the accounts. And in terms of your management letter, you had no comments um, to make on the accounting systems or processes. It's a little bit unusual for the auditors not to have some form of suggestion. No, I mean, uh, we did have a detailed look in terms of all of the controls, all of the staff were briefed, and it was a very experienced audit team. Um, but no, there was no control weaknesses identified during the course of the audit. OK, thank you. How, how often do you meet uh, Audit Scotland's Audit Committee? Uh, we attend each of the Audit Committee meetings throughout the year. You're at every meeting? Yes. How many is that? Um, the memory there's about four meetings a year. Four. OK. Who, are, who handles the internal audit for Audit Scotland? Uh, that's uh, BDO, an internal audit firm. And do you meet them regularly? Yes, um, we meet the internal audit firm. Well, we see them at the audit committee meetings, but we also have discussions with them prior to then enter them audit, and then again prior to signing off the final audit, uh, just to make sure we are aware of any issues or any concerns that they have. And do you have a protocol for communicating that? You know, do they, do they, is there a level of severity or whatever at which they will contact you? Um, we, we have a, a discussion at both stages in the audit process, uh, regardless of if there are any concerns. During the course of the year, we also get all of the internal audit reports, so we're aware of any findings that they have and any concerns at those meetings. Uh, but we make sure that before we carry out our interim work and before the final is completed, that we have a discussion with them just to make sure we cover any aspect at all. When I talked previously about a protocol, do you have a, a clear parameters within which they work and you work and how you communicate? Yes, I mean, we are... Um, Throughout the process, we'll see the internal audit, uh, the scope of their work, their planned audit programme, we take that into account. Um, we make sure that we look at if they've flagged up any areas which are concerned, which will have an impact on the audit, we'll then build that into our external audit work. Um, even if they are satisfied in any areas that we're looking at, from an external audit point of view, we are still t checking the controls to make sure we satisfy ourselves uh, that the systems are working to be able to give our level of assurance that we require. Now, you were present when, I, when uh, I was discussing with the previous panel about uh, fee structures. Mm -hmm. Have you had occasion to look at the changes in fee structure? Yes, I mean, well, we're aware uh, Audit Scotland has cut the fees and uh, we have been uh, certainly at committee meetings and we've seen the discussions and the focus in terms of quality and at the audit committee meetings. I was thinking rather about the uh, the previous problem that Audit Scotland had, if you call it a problem, about cross subsidy, mm -hmm. and how they re restructured their fees to eliminate that. I mean, while we have had a look in terms of the external audit, uh, we haven't had a detailed examination that would form more part of an internal audit or economy uh, of the e audit, uh, looking at that in further detail. Uh, we have just looked at it from the uh, from the viewpoint of the external audit and how it implicates the financial statements. It's a significant thing. Mm -hmm. It's a significant change in Audit Scotland. Mm -hmm. I would sort of thought that the external auditors might have had a look at that. I mean, we've certainly had a look at the fees, the uh, how it's been charged for the uh, in terms of that. Um, I may be misinterpreting the question, but to have a look in terms of the actual cost, how that's built up in terms of each um, each individual client and how that reflects in the overall fee would be a, a large and additional piece of work to carry that out. Mm -hmm. OK. Does any member have any other questions? 
in that case, thank you very much for your attendance. And uh, as agreed at the beginning of the meeting, we'll move into private session. <laughs>